For many people, if you are dealing with some kind of a chronic health issue, or even if you're just trying to make sure that you are staying as healthy as possible, the biggest thing that you tend to look at is food. But it turns out food is only one part of the equation. There is so much more that goes into living a vibrant, healthy, wonderful life. And today I am just delighted to be talking with Danny Williamson, who is going to share her beautiful wisdom with us. Danny is a colleague and a friend. We meet up at conferences occasionally. She is a family nurse practitioner. She's also the author of this amazing book, Wild and Well. I do highly recommend this. And she is going to share with us today her six steps to healing. Danny, thank you for being here. Girl, I am so thrilled to be here. And you are so right that we always think that diet is 100%. And it is. It's so important. If you don't heal the gut, you won't you won't heal anything else, right? The gut and the adrenals, the thyroid, the hormones, that's all connected to the gut. But there's more than that out there. And I spent 24 years seeing doctors fast or go backwards 50 something years. I grew up in a tremendous amount of childhood trauma, which is something we could have a whole podcast about, right? which created a lot of gut issues for me and autoimmune and lots of things. And I spent 44 years, 24 years seeing doctors. I was 44 years old before a doctor ever looked at me and said, Danny, what are you eating? Don't you know your diet contributes to your issues? And that was great. It changed my whole world, but, and changed the trajectory of my medical practice and my life. And I hope my kids, when I realized what was at the end of my fork, could heal you or kill you simple as that. But I got to working with patients more and I realized, holy cow, not only do you have to eat well, you've got to sleep, move well, poop, de-stress well, and commune well. And those are my six steps that we talk about in here and I teach all day and it's all connected, right? The gut, you talk about it all day. Your tribe is well-versed in that. You've got to heal the gut, right? If you're eating an inflammatory diet, I'm sorry, you're going to have to stop driving through Chick-fil-A and McDonald's and eating the packages and all that. And we don't have to dive into that, but it's key. But you got to sleep well, don't you? And I think so many people don't realize that how much sleep actually affects your ability to metabolize what you're eating. If you're not sleeping well, your body's not processing well. No. And it's not necessarily actually right what you eat. It is what you eat, but this is what you assimilate and what you digest and what you eliminate. And if you don't sleep well, you will never eat well because you're exhausted. Right. And my aura ring tells me, "Ah, I probably should rest today because apparently I didn't sleep really great last night. But your body heals when you sleep. The bed is for sleep and sex only. And if you're not doing one or the other in it, get out of it. No computers, no cell phones, no TVs, wireless routers in there, all the things that are going to disrupt their circadian rhythm. And your bedroom needs to be clean. It needs to be clean. It needs to be a sanctuary. When you walk across that threshold to go into bed at night, to get into the bed, it doesn't need to be a cluttered, chaotic mess. And you need a sleep routine. And if you're sleeping on an electric bed, I hate to tell you this, you're sleeping on a minefield of electricity, possibly disrupting your circadian rhythm. So you're, you've are got to sleep. And there's many ways to get you to sleep. I wrote a whole chapter on, of course, <laughs> sleeping in here. And I mean, about the, the epidemic of insomnia we have going on and mm. sleep apnea. Yeah. Untreated sleep apnea can take a decade off of your life. Wow. A decade. Oh my gosh. If you can't breathe at night, you're going to die sooner. It's as simple as that. And if you snore. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. If you snore. You may not have sleep apnea, but you have a 90% chance of having sleep apnea if you snore. So the odds are pretty good that you've got sleep apnea. And when you, and nobody wants to wear a CPAP, but I am telling you, when you get that addressed, man, you start to sleep better. And when you wake up, you feel better. And guess what? Then you're going to eat better. And what I was going to say is we tend to not be aware because we don't really learn this very well in school or when we're growing up. 
the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And that parasympathetic is rest and digest. digest. Both yes. those things go together. And so we really do need to learn to pay attention to that. So do you, aside from making sure that sleep is a sanctuary and a quiet space and everything, do you have any recommendations for people about how long between your last meal so that you can digest fully before you try to go to sleep? I tell people I would prefer it's at least four hours after mm -hmm. your last meal. But then we have the caveat of the people who wake up between two and four in the morning, their blood sugar dropping in the night, maybe. They don't need to wait that long before they go to bed. It's about balance and paying attention to your body because every single person who's listening to this is different. Yes. So maybe they need e extra protein before they go to bed at night to keep that blood sugar stable so it doesn't drop. Because when blood sugar, it's protein that keeps your blood sugar stable during the day. When the blood sugar drops at night, when you're sound asleep, cortisol is going to rise and you have to wake up, right? And you, or you'll be in a diabetic coma. So maybe some people need a little bit of protein before bed, a scoop of almond butter, some nuts. I don't know, a piece of chicken, I don't, something like that. To, but something you know, small, it's not meant to be a meal. Small. No, yeah. not a meal, not a meal. But you, and alcohol does not help you sleep, by the way. And I think that's one of the reasons I didn't sleep last night because I drank wine with a friend of mine, not too much wine, but like two glasses of wine. And that was too much for me last night. Wine will raise that blood sugar up and drop it back down. You do not sleep better if you drink alcohol. It's as simple as that, right? So then let's talk about what happens after sleep when you get up, moving your body, being physically active. You got to eat well, sleep well, move well. If you're not sleeping well, you will never move well. Therefore, you won't eat well. It's all connected and we have to move. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you are a ballroom dancer, a hula hooper, a roller blader, does not matter to me. Move your stinking body. Our bodies are designed to be moved. When you stop moving, you stop moving, period. And you're not going to poop either, which is the next one, right? You got to poop. Yeah. But you got to move your body. You slip. The research is clear. The people mm -hmm. who exercise sleep better and they eat better. They're just more health conscious. And again, it doesn't matter. I don't care what you do, but you got to burn the calories yeah. and you have to move your body. Your depression is better when you move your body. Your anxiety is better. Your period cramps are better. Your sex drive is better when you move your body. You get those endorphins going. And for women, the research is clear. We need to exercise in the morning, which mm -hmm. means you got to get your butt up early. And see, I love that you said that because my husband is, he loves to go to the gym in the afternoon. And I just, I get up 5.30 in the morning and go to bar class. I, if I'm going to go for a walk, I go for a walk in the morning. I, my body just does so much better. Is there any kind of a like hormonal reason or metabolic reason why women do better in the morning? Metabolically, we burn, I think. I have it in the book, but I can't remember. I think your metabolism is sped up something like 12 to 13 hours for women oh, when wow. they exercise in the morning. Yes. Yeah. There's a metabolic reason. And your testosterone levels are higher in the morning and our circadian rhythm, the 24 hours testosterone levels are higher. You're just, we, our bodies are better in the morning and I am, I'm much better in the morning. I, I see the majority of my patients before noon. They know only put a few people afternoon for me after 12 or one o'clock for me because I am way better in the morning. So yeah. you've got to move, find a buddy right? Find a buddy. You're not going to leave your buddy standing on the corner at six in the morning waiting for you if you have somebody who's counting on you, right? Yeah. No, that's very true. That's very true. And like you said, moving into the next one, if you don't move well, you don't poop well. And if you don't eat well, you don't poop well. And if you don't no. sleep well, you don't poop well. Like it all goes together. And it clamps down right here. You can't say right here in that pelvic area. And so many people do not have regular bowel movements, right? Mm -hmm. They don't, they poop, that their doctor tells them, oh, it's fine. Some people only poop twice a week. What? That is the biggest BS I've ever heard. 
We are designed for you. to eliminate what you eat today should be gone tomorrow. It should yeah. in 24 hours. And I've got a standard poodle laying right here beside me. And I always tell people, because he goes to the office with me, I'm like, you need to poop like Edwin the poodle. Edwin poops, <laughs> he eats, and he goes and poops, and he flies through that door getting the zoomies. He's very happy about it. But a lot of people don't poop. The number one reason for constipation is dehydration. Number mm-hmm. one, that's a real easy fix if people will just simply drink at least half their body weight in ounces in water every day. Or maybe you need a little magnesium, but if you don't exercise, you won't poop as well, right? If you're right. eating all this inflammatory food, you're not going to poop. And if you're not sleeping. So it's all connected, all these balls in the air, right? Eat well, sleep well, move well, poop well, de-stress well. So I'd like to go back just one second to the pooping before we move on to stress because de-stressing is so important. But for anyone who's listening who is not pooping every day, I just want to remind you, your gut really needs you to poop every day. And if that bolus stays in, your body starts to reabsorb from what's sitting in there. And so you're getting the toxins and everything else. And it's also pulling water. So if you're dehydrated and it's pulling water from the fecal matter, all of a sudden you are backed up and clogged and it's not great. No, and you're reabsorbing those toxins. And yes, so we need to get you, maybe you need some magnesium. Maybe you need a good probiotic or a prebiotic, or maybe you need some digestive enzymes. Again, everyone is different. There's no one magic bullet. Although this is the magic bullet for everyone. Water, have a little vitamin C in here because you can hear my allergies are acting up a little bit. So it's really important and we need to figure it out. Yoga will help you go to the bathroom. Twist, like when you're twisting, Mm -hmm. excellent for constipation. You can type in yoga for constipation. You're going to have a lot of twists because you're wringing out the spine and those intestines. So again, it's connected. And then de-stress. Let me tell you, if the last three years haven't taught us anything, they should have taught us about right? Stress and de-stressing. We are a nation of empty vessels, men and women, but women for sure. We are pouring from an empty vessel. There's nothing there. We Mm -hmm. don't have any margin in our life, right? It's as tight as this Zoom screen here, right? There's no margin at all in our life. And when one little thing goes haywire, we lose it. And or we've got anxiety or panic or whatever. We may or may not be the head of the household in our home. I'm the head of the household on the taxes because I'm a single mom. It doesn't matter if you're the head of the household or not. If you're not, it doesn't matter. But we set the tone for the entire home. The yeah. woman does. The minute we walk through that door right there, whatever mood we're in, the entire home picks up on. Yeah, And I'm telling you, you've got to automate, eliminate, and delegate as much as you can out of your life. You've got to bring your life back to life. AED, those automatic external defibrillators that if you go into cardiac arrest that we bring you back to life, you've got to do the same thing with your life. Automate everything you can. Eliminate everything you can that's not serving you well and your family and delegate stuff. We don't delegate things to our spouses or our partners or our kids because it's just easier to do it myself. How's that working for you? And for your kids, they're not learning. If you don't delegate to them, how are they going to learn how to grow up and be successful adults to know how to feed themselves and do laundry and That's right. pick up after the kids them? want to learn these things, right? And this counts for soul suckers in your life. Eliminate mm-hmm. the people that are causing you horrible stress that suck the life out of you. You have the right to remove those people from your life and you have the right to set your boundaries. We teach people how to treat us. And there's a lot of men and women out there who have unnecessary stress because they refuse to set the boundary. And if I believe in Jesus, a lot of people don't, doesn't matter what you believe in, but Jesus was good at setting boundaries. When he needed space, he put some river or some space between he and his people, him and his people. And if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. I tell people that every single day. So you've got to, uh, 
my mother has Alzheimer's and we've never had a good relationship. And it, I, years ago, I set my boundaries. Now things are a little weird because I'm an only child and I have to take care of her. But I, I set boundaries years ago and you can do that. We don't have mm-hmm. to keep people in our lives that literally drag us down. And we don't, I don't think we realize that we also don't have to host host Thanksgiving or Christmas if we don't want to, if it causes us stress. You have the right to say, I'm not doing it this year. And I would also say that what is a good de-stress practice, just like we talk about food being bio-individual and sleep being bio-individual and everything else, different people are going to respond to different things. So some people are going to pray. Some people are going to journal. Some people are going to go for a walk in nature, whatever it is that you have to do to take care of yourself. That's right. You do it for yourself and you put your oxygen mask on first because you're worthy to be 150%. When you put your mask on and when your vessel is full and you are 100%, It's the overflow that everyone benefits from. You don't fill your vessel up or go do your self-care because you got to take care of your family. Absolutely not. You do it because you got to take care of yourself. And when you are well-rested and your vessel's full, your overflow benefits your children, your spouse, your job, your friends, whatever, your family. And we've got it so backwards, so backwards. And I think, unfortunately... There is, you're right, there's this mentality of work now, play later, but the work is never done. So the goal is to create. And then that actually leads into your last point, because if we're always engaged in work and always trying to be responsible and step up and take care of everything and everyone else, like we have no time for gathering. We have no time for that support system that's so important to us. Community is key. It's not necessarily the last step it is for me, but it is very important because guess what? When you have your tribe together, the research is clear, right? Your cortisol levels go down, right? You're, when you're laughing with your friends, what, you know, your immune system goes up. You're healthier when you have a tribe. And it doesn't have to be 12 people, right? Like the 12 disciples. It could be two people. Yeah. And here we are. We go have some coffee or we meet at the house and we go to the vineyard. I don't know. You go to the park. Community is key. Cultivating community. Somebody has to be the ringleader. It happens to be me and my fam- in my community. I'm the one who puts together the cookouts and the girls' nights at my house and all that stuff. And I love it. I love doing it. But it's so key. We are the loneliest society we have ever been. Suicide rates are going through the roof. Phone calls to suicide crisis lines went up 800% since the pandemic. 800%. I'm on the board for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention for the state of Tennessee. The fastest growing rate of suicide is age 10, 10 years old to 24. 10 to 24 are dying by suicide faster than any other rate. They don't have community. And they don't. And part of the challenge is their community has been replaced by electronics. I know. Right there. I remember when I was a kid, we had the little neighborhood gang, and maybe we weren't best friends, but we had nobody else to hang out with. So we all figured it out and we would climb trees and run around the woods and through the woods. And I lived in the country, I only had one neighbor out there. But Yeah, so we had other ways to create community, and we did, but this is not your community. I can darn sure tell you this right here. You've got to be eyeball to eyeball with people, right? There's also the energetic exchange when you're connected with somebody. Like, I love that you and I are talking right now on Zoom. But for me, one of the biggest problems was the Zoom overload from the pandemic because there's no energy exchange here. No, you have to be no. together in person and breaking bread or gluten free bread. I tell people breaking bread and just eating around the table with your people with no agenda and just I talking eyeball to eyeball. So community is key. And when you have community, you eat better and you sleep better and you exercise, you move better. It's all connected. It's not rocket science. I'm not the smartest one in the box out there, but I've got a lot of common sense and it just works. But then the one piece that that I missed for years and I have now added into this is the childhood trauma. 
Because if you don't address what happened to you before the age of 18, it's real difficult to get all these other things in order when you're really carrying that baggage because the body does keep score, doesn't it, of what of the childhood trauma. And I had a lot of trauma in my family. And once I really addressed that about seven years ago, everything in my life started to turn around and my body started to heal even more. So it's a big piece of it. And I address it ad nauseum in here because I'm going to have to have you back to talk about that because I think that is like probably a whole topic in and of itself. It is. And I deal with a lot of autoimmune patients in the clinic. And I regret that the first probably eight or nine years of being in practice, I never talked to them. I never gave them the ACE questionnaire. I never talked to them about the childhood trauma. So now I'm able to help them on this healing journey, even uh, take it even further and feel better emotionally physically, spiritually, mentally, sexually, it's all connected. That's so important. And the other thing that I want to clarify to anybody who's listening, you've shared six really wonderful foundational pillars of what we need to do to be healthy. It's not a linear thing. It's look at your life and figure out what do I need to work on and just work on that one thing and move on to something else. That's Um, right. But I also really love, and so I guess I want to ask you if this is the key to it all. I love your AED analogy, like automate, what was it? Automate? Eliminate. Eliminate and delegate. Like that to me sounds like the foundation to this whole thing. You bet. And I stole that from my friend, Michael Hyatt. Now he isn't talking about healthcare when he talks about that. He's talking about business stuff and all that, but Again, it's not even about healthcare. It's about your life, right? Automate, eliminate, delegate everything. And I do break it down specifically in there on things. And yeah, so it's key. And I'm just telling you, having the freedom to say, I can't do this. I can't host Thanksgiving. That's a big one for my patients. The holidays are a tremendous amount of stress. Danny, I've always hosted Thanksgiving. Do you enjoy it? Because if you enjoy it, keep doing it, right? Yeah. No, I don't. In fact, it's a nightmare every year. Then don't do it this mm-hmm. year. You got what is May. You've got five months or whatever until Thanksgiving. You got plenty of time to put the word out. We're yeah. not doing it this year. And it's also about figuring out how to make it work. Because like for me, my happy place is having Thanksgiving. Me too. But me too. I live thousands of miles away from my family. So what we do is my cousin hosts and my sister-in-law is on cleanup duty and I cook. And so everybody's happy and we can all get together. Like right. it's about figuring out because for the rest of them to come down to me would be hard. But if I go up there, I feel like I'm not doing anything. So I just called her and I'm like, can I do all the cooking? She's like, really? You want to do that? So taking that time to figure out what works for you, I think is also really important. And that again, you know, one of the other things that I'll share is I know I have a number of clients where for them, their holiday gatherings are with people other than family. Their community is outside of family and they have a wonderful time and they love it. So yeah. Their friends giving and their yes, absolutely. Their That's exactly right. Your fr- your family does not have to be blood related. And so again, that's about the cultivating the community. So I just, and and like I said, it's not linear like that. And none of those balls are all in the air at the same time, beautifully aligned around you. Something's always going to be dropping off, but eventually it is a lifestyle and you're going to live your life like this. And eventually you realize there's not enough whatever in the world to make me go back to how I felt before. Maybe it's gluten or dairy or stress or just not doing it. And eventually the older you get, and I tell people in six months, you're going to be like, Danny, I feel so much better. I'm not where I need to be, but I'm getting there. If you're 50 years old and just now figuring this out, you've got five decades of dysfunction that we have to untangle over here. So it's going to take longer than five weeks, isn't it? To figure it out. But it's just, it's a lifestyle and it's one step, one foot in front of the other. And I'm telling you, I feel great, even though I sound horrible today, I feel great and I really feel like I'm pretty darn balanced in things and it's taken a lot of work and you can do it. Your tribe can do it. It's not rocket science. It Absolutely. And you've shared so many wonderful things for us to think about. And I just want to remind people, because I happen to have an autographed copy because I saw you when it came out. 
This is a great book. I will put the link below, but okay. this has obviously the expanded version of this conversation because you've got a lot of step-by-step stuff in here, resources, information yes. that people really need. I made it as a guidebook for people. And I tell you yeah. what, it, it did not make it to the New York Times bestseller list. I still think it doesn't should. Matter. It wasn't Amazon bestseller, number one, it, oh, actually. And it, that doesn't matter. It's such a great book. And I think for anybody who needs this, one of the things that I love is each section is by itself. So if you're like, man, I need to learn how to sleep well. Guess what? Whole chapter on sleep well in here. Yeah. You and I made it so that people that. could read it fast and it would be a guidebook and you use your highlighter and go through it. It's common sense, practical medicine, as it says right there on the tagline, common sense, practical so medicine. So great. Danny. this has been amazing. I always, I love talking with you. I love your energy and I love Thank your you. straightforward, no nonsense approach. That's so, right. Thank you for that. If someone Appreciate wanted to connect you. with you, where would they find you? DannyWilliamson.com is the website. And but Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, all the same. Danny Williamson Perfect. Wellness. And Perfect. just like you, we give out tons of free education every day. People who do what we do love what we do and we love to give education. So Danny Williamson Wellness on all three social media platforms. That sounds great. And I will put all the links below. I will also put Danny's amazing bio below so you can read about her. Thanks so much for joining us. And I want to encourage everyone watching this to remember to use and start with one of the six steps to take care of yourself and make right. it a healthy day. That's Bye, right. folks.